Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Christine Nemec. I work at the University of Northern Iowa Tallgrass Prairie Center, where I'm a program manager. And this is the first time we've tried having a virtual meeting where anyone interested in county roadside programs is invited to learn more. We also have a few new roadside managers who are invited to attend. So they can also learn more about what resources are available to counties who want to have a roadside vegetation program. First of all, for introductions, if you could please put your name and where you're from in the chat and your position, just in the interest of time, and since we have a lot of people expected to be on, that kind of helps us get to know who's, who's who, and people can skim through the chat and see what counties people are from. I think we had a, a pretty good range of counties from around the state registered for today. We have people from counties without programs and people from counties with programs, county officials, engineers, conservation board directors, just a variety of folks who registered, which is great. I'll give you a hey, little bit of Christine. time to do that. But was there a question, please? Yeah, Christine, this is Damian Bond from Montgomery County. I'm calling in. Is I don't see a way to enter my name oh. and location on the chat. I will rename you then. So we have Damian Bond, who's the Montgomery County Road Same Manager. Yes. So I just, yep, there we go. So Damian will be joining by phone to talk about his experiences with his program. Okay, I think people have had a chance to start entering their name and position if you'd like. So we'll move on to the next part. I'll just give you an overview of what we'll be doing this morning. Cody Unstad with the contractor with the Iowa DOT will be explaining about the resources the Living Road Rate Trust Fund can offer to counties. I'll be talking about the resources my office can offer. And then Damian will be talking about the county perspective. And then there'll be a lot of time for questions. If you have any questions, any urgent questions while we're giving our presentation, you're welcome to do that, but just also keep in mind we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. So I will turn it over to Cody to present about the Living Road Rate Trust Fund. I will try to share my screen here. All right, is everybody seeing that okay? Looks good. All right. So, hello everyone. Looks like we have a good turnout today, so thank you everybody for joining in. Today, I'm gonna give an overview of Iowa's Living Roadway Trust Fund program and some of the uh, resources available through it. Um, so, as Christine said, my name's Cody Unstead. I'm the program assistant for the Living Roadway Trust Fund and have uh, been doing this for a little under a year now. The program coordinator for Living Roadway Trust Fund is Tara Van Wass, and she is based out of the Iowa Department of Transportation headquarters in Ames. So to start with, I'm gonna cover a little bit of Iowa history that led to the creation of the Living Roadway Trust Fund. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but between the 1830 and 1900, the prairie underwent one of the most drastic land transformations in human history. Uh, using the steel plow, European settlers steadily converted the North American prairie into farmland. This conversion was even more pronounced in Iowa, where 80% of the land cover had been prairie. Uh, and today, approximately one-tenth of one percent of that original prairie remains in Iowa. Then skip ahead to the mid-1970s when a fuel shortage and subsequent rise in fuel prices generated nationwide investigations into methods to save money spent on fuel. The Iowa DOT, being one of the largest landowners in the state, conduct conducted its own cost-cutting investigations up to this point, roadsides in Iowa were extensively mowed and blanket sprayed with herbicides. And this method of uh, roadside management was often too, 
costly to implement on a regular basis. The springs were frequently ineffective at controlling invasives and they had the negative effect of increasing surface water contamination. So consequently, Iowa implemented one of the nation's first integrated roadside vegetation management programs or IRVM. And the goal of the IRVM program was to provide an alternative to these typical roadside management practices. Then in the 1980s, the Living Roadway Trust Fund program was developed in Iowa uh, to provide crucial funding to fully support and expand these practices of managing roadside vegetation using native prairie plant plants through grants. And it also provided the initial funding for a roadside vegetation office within the Iowa DOT. And so in November of 1989, the very first LRTF coordinator was hired. So uh, it's been around for 33 years now. So Iowa is unique in having the Living Roadway Trust Fund, um, which is also called LRTF. Um, in 1988, the Iowa legislature, legislature established LRTF within Iowa Code 314.21. Uh, the Living Roadway Trust Fund was created in the Office of the Treasurer of State. The Iowa Department of Transportation administers this fund, and the objective is to ensure that roadside vegetation is preserved, planted, and maintained to be safe visually interesting, ecologically integrated, and useful for many purposes um, is some of the language out of that code. So funding for LRTF comes from three different sources. The first source being REAP, or the Iowa Resource Enhancement and Protection Fund, um, which provides 3% of its annual funding plus a percentage of REAP license plate fees to LRTF. $12 million was approved for REAP this year, so that amounts to $360,000 plus the REAP license plate fee percentage, which amounts to about $24,000, um, all going to LRTF. Then the second source is the road use tax, fan, road use tax fund and that's just a flat rate of $250,000. And then the third source is utility access fees. This comes from Iowa Code 314.2, where the Iowa DOT has an accommodation plan for utility use of freeway right of way um, in consultation with the utility boards. And so basically extended payments and lease agreements are provided or to provide continuous funding for the Living Roadway Trust Fund. And this fluctuates a little from year to year, but averages around 135,000 annually going to LRTF. So between these three sources, the total annual funding is approximately $770,000. So, Iowa code specifies how these funds should be allocated between state, counties, and cities, with 47.5% going to state, 32.5% going to counties, and 20% going to cities. And of the portion going to state, up to 150,000 may be applied to the Iowa DOT for program administration and support for a program assistant position. And then from the county portion, 75,000 goes to UNI to secure the state roadside specialist to coordinate educational outreach and services and to help start integrated roadside management programs. So what does the Living Roadway Trust Fund do with these funds? Well, working through many partners in Iowa, LRTFs supports IRVM programs and educates the public on the benefits, use, and care of roadside vegetation, including the use of native plants. LRTF accomplishes this through grants, which are administered by the Iowa DOT. The grant program provides funding for IRVM activities to cities, counties, and applicants with statewide impact. 
through publications produced to inform the public about aspects of IRBM. Um, these materials are geared for all audiences ranging from youth to adults. Um, through research, which is sponsored to address questions about best management practices of IRBM and to develop new and innovative solutions to roadside issues. So through the years, the LRTF has supported the study of a wide variety of issues like roadside butterfly habitat um, and a number of others related to vegetation management. Uh, requests for research proposals are regularly announced and also investigator initiated research is also considered for funding um, if a researcher out there has a great idea and so then there's educational programs is another way that lrtf uses their funds um, educational programs are sponsored to develop high quality publications and seminars to educate the public about the benefits of irvm and to provide training opportunities to professionals in the field. And then as mentioned, LRTF funds a competitive annual grant program for cities, counties, and statewide applicants. And as of April 1st, 1990, Iowa Code updated the eligibility requirements so that a city or county are not eligible to receive monies from Living Roadway Trust Fund unless that city or county has an RVM plan on file with the Iowa DOT. And so I've been talking a lot about integrated roadside vegetation management or IRVM. Um, so now I'm gonna go into a little more about what it is. The main goals of IRVM are to establish diverse stands of native plants in the roadside right of ways reduce erosion, enhance rainfall infiltration, create habitat for pollinators, nesting birds, and other wildlife, provide more aesthetically pleasing roadsides, maintain a safe travel environment on roadsides, and reduce roadside maintenance by establishing a strong plant community using Iowa's native vegetation with the goal of mowing less and using less herbicides. And so now we know a little more about what IRVM is targeting. What is an IRVM plan? Well, basically you can look at it as creating a business plan or a guidebook for your specific county or city on how to approach managing vegetation in your roadsides. So reasons for creating an IRVM plan. It helps identify your county's goals for the IRVM program. Having a plan in place helps when there is our staff changes so the program can continue to move forward towards these goals. Um, example goals could be to save the county money or could be to, to manage noxious weeds better. Um, record keeping, the plan documents why, the, why it was first adopted. And if the plan is kept current, it will show how your county's IRVM program focus may have changed over time. It's to guide decision making. The plan will establish a management hierarchy, including defining the Board of Supervisors' role in overseeing the program. It will clearly state who makes the decisions of what gets done and when those things get done. The plan references local laws and regulations that are applicable in your county. Um, so, some examples would be mowing laws, herbicide spraying laws at-risk species, noxious weed laws, and winter maintenance operations and removal of obstructions in the right-of-way. It references local permitting processes and includes relevant permit forms and also references state repercussions for violators. And the program operation section of the plan explains what to do and when to do it, such as annual operations, work area types, vegetation types for specific uses, special projects and training such as for safety or fire. The methods section of the plan should state your county's approach to vegetation establishment and maintenance. And once created, it could also be 
um, a useful guide for new employees. The IRVM plan will include storage plans for seed, erosion control materials and chemicals, will identify your limits for what you can order, obtain and store without having to make other arrangements. The plans would identify an annual budget and could also include a summary of prior year and current year. Um, and for a lot of counties, the budget is their driving force for IRVM. The budget can help demonstrate how IRVM is working for your county. And like stated before, IRVM emphasizes the use of native vegetation with appropriate managed management techniques to produce a cost-effective, emphasis on cost-effective, environmentally sound management alternative to conventional heavy mowing and herbicide use. And so this cost effectiveness should be reflected in your budget. So back to the annual grant program. The first step for counties and cities is to create an IRVM plan. And then once you have the plan in place, you can evaluate where living roadway trust fund money can best assist you. So other requirements for grants, proposed projects must be located on city, county, or state right of way or on public land immediately adjacent to the right of way. A cash or in-kind match matching contribution of 20% or the maximum allowable amount of the grant, whichever is less. Research and education don't require matching funds. Maximum funding amounts vary based on your project type. And these, this is listed in the funding guidelines, which can be found on the LRTF website. And then for as far as the reimbursement, you're not allowed to spend money on your project until a contract agreement is signed by the applicant and the DOT representative. And so there's a number of categories that can be funded through the LRTF grant program. I know uh, a lot of counties go after the specialized equipment and that's very important, but there are a number of other things um, that you can apply for that might be useful to your IRVM program. So I'll give a, a brief overview of these categories next. There are demonstration projects. These must be designed to show the positive aspects of IRVM and document the benefits of using native plants in roadsides. These projects should be highly visible and allow for an educational component such as signage. Education projects inform project participants and the general public about the use of native plants is an integral component of IRVM. Funding may be provided for seminars, conferences, classroom instruction, or other related opportunities Funding may also be provided for costs associated with producing educational signage, displays, newsletters, books, and brochures. Outdoor learning environments are projects which are developed for teaching and related educational purposes on public properties. Um, and they're actually funded through a separate outdoor learning environment grant process that LRTF has. It's a sequ sequential three-phase grant process um, that seeks to build a network of support for projects that are designed, installed, established, and maintained to be a long-term resource. The grant program funds electronic equipment, such as communications equipment, like two-way radios or intercoms used during prescribed burning, herbicide application, or hydro seeding. It could also include GPS equipment and related software. Specialized equipment needed to establish alternative forms of roadside vegetation. Common examples are mulchers, blowers, herbicide equipment, mowers, wood chippers, seeding equipment like broadcast seeders, cultipackers, drop seeders, hydro seeders, no-till drill, soil preparation equipment, UTVs or heavy duty trucks equipped for hydro seeding or spraying. Gateways, community entryways and scenic value protection and enhancements. Uh, gateway and roadside plantings must be located on city, county, state or federal right of ways or public land immediately adjacent to the right of ways. 
revegetation projects are also eligible for funding through this. Um, in some rare instances, properties become available that demonstrate both a significant ecological value and directly connect to the work of a local IRVM program. And so state code enables LRTF to assist in acquiring these properties. For these kinds of situations, applicants must fully demonstrate the ecological significance of an area and illustrate how the property will be used in conjunction with the local IRVM program in order to be considered. Um, these awards are rare and are held to a higher standard. Planning, design, and professional services requiring the assistance of a third party professional are eligible for funding. Planning and design professionals must be licensed in the state of Iowa. Uh, the maximum for these proje projects are 6,000. And then research. Research projects must address current issues surrounding the practice of IRVM as determined by the Technical Advisory Committee and the Iowa DOT. Investigator proposed research may be considered for funding. Somebody out there has a great idea that would help our roadsides. Projects are funded through universities and colleges, as well as specialized private firms and individuals. Uh, research is funded on a year-by-year -year basis, so applications for multi-year projects need to be submitted every year. And then roadside inventories and remnant vegetation surveys. To effectively implement IRVM, roadside departments need some baseline information about roadside conditions such as herbaceous cover, woody cover, bare areas, erosion, encroachment, and other roadside characteristics. And then roadside remnant vegetation surveys, identify and map remnant vegetation adjacent to or visible from roadsides that could be used as a potential seed source for IRVM activities. It's also a category for other related projects, which keeps options open that are applicable to IRVM, but not specifically called out elsewhere. So some previous examples of these have been equipment storage, seed storage, and herbicide storage facilities. And then lastly, special staff training. LRTF can uh, fund registration and expenses for seminars, conferences, and training sessions related to IRVM. So application, the application and the funding guidelines can be found on the Living Roadway Trust Fund website. Uh, there's also a new instructional video on the website that walks through the application process. Uh, the application deadline is June 1st at 4 p.m. for the next fiscal year funding. And as mentioned previously, cities and counties need to have an IRVM plan on file by the state. The Technical Advisory Committee reviews the grant applications. And per Iowa Code, the committee has representatives from the utility industry, the Iowa Academy of Sciences, from county government, from city government, from the private sector, including community interest groups, uh, soil conservation interests, the Department of Natural Resources, and representatives from the county conservation boards. And then as mentioned, LRTF has a number of great publications out there. These are all available at no charge. Just visit the LRTF website to order. There are five guidebooks and the number of posters available. Uh, the website order form limits you to six, but if you want more, just put in the comments on the, uh, on the order block at the bottom of the website, how many you want, we can coordinate that. Um, the website, you can either go to iowadot.gov slash LRTF, or if it's easier to remember, iowalivingroadway.com takes you to the same place. 
And so to conclude, I just want to emphasize again that Iowa is very unique in having a program such as the Living Roadway Trust Fund. And so I'd just like to encourage you all to share in what it can do to assist uh, your local community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Cody. Are there any questions for Cody? I can hold off on my questions until later, I guess, until I hear the rest of the presentations. But I did have some questions about the match, like how that works. Um, reading through the funding guidelines, it sounded like in some places it said it sounds like you can use in-kind matching, but in other places it sounds like it has to be cash match to meet that 20%. Is there a give a clarifying on that? what that needs to be. I know specifically, like, I think specialized equipment, I think would have to be cash only. You couldn't match that really, since you're spending money to buy the equipment. I don't think that could be matched with in kind, but I think typically the other projects where you're out, you know, doing some work, the match could come from in kind contributions that you do. And I can, I can talk to Tara and get back to you, but at least that's my understanding. Like if it's something like equipment where you're spending cash, the, the, it would have to be a cash match. <laughs> for, for example, uh, we, like in that situation of the specialized equipment, if, if we want to buy a hydro seeder, well, maybe that's not a good example because you'll actually pay for a truck. So, um, Maybe a tractor is a better better example. So, like it, it specifically says in there that our uh, LRTF money doesn't pay for for tractors because they can use for be used for other things besides uh, roadway uh, or you know vegetation management. But could we use if we're going to buy a tractor for our IRBM program? Could we use the dollars that comes out of our budget out of pocket buying the tractor? Could we use that as match for buying the roadside, uh, you know, the vegetation accessories. So if we buy like a brush hog or uh, like a boom mower or a cedar for accessories for that tractor, could we use the dollars we spent on the tractor as match for the grant money? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think I can answer that specifically. I'd have to talk to Tara and get back to you about that specific kind of situation. That is a fair and honest answer. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Cody? If you think of anything, you're always welcome to, to ask that too, as we have questions at the end as well. I will go ahead and share my screen to move into what I do it. Let's see, I have to pull it up here. I see it on my desktop from beginning. I might have to have Cody bring it up for some reason. It's on my desktop, but it won't share.
So Cody, I'm gonna send you my PowerPoint if that'll work, if you could pull it up. Let's see. I'm glad Cody's PowerPoint went well, but for some reason it won't let me share mine. So I just sent you the email. If I have some visuals like a map, it'd be really nice to be able to show. As far as the plans go, while we're waiting for Cody to bring that up, I just want to say newer counties, especially, they tend to be a little bit more prioritized for some certain things like getting a roadside vegetation inventory. I know newer counties kind of find that helpful where they can get money to hire a contractor to survey all of the vegetation and get kind of a baseline information about areas that have a lot of weeds that are priority or areas that maybe have native prairie left in the roadside that want to be you might want to protect. So I got your email, but when I click the link, it says I need access. Oh. You need access. Because probably Google, through a Google, Google Drive. Drive. Well. Oh, it's kind of odd that it's not sharing. I might have to talk through this since it's not, I don't think we have an easy way to share it. I'll try one more thing and then I'll just talk through my presentation here. All right, can you see the presentation that way? Yes, I can. Okay, well, that's one way to do it. It's a little bit different than I was expecting, but it'll work. Wouldn't be a Zoom without some kind of glitch. <laughs> we weren't expecting it to be on my end, but that's okay. We got it to work. So you can see my Google Slides kind of PowerPoint then. Okay. I'll talk about what my office can provide from the UNI Tallgrass Prairie Center. Now, just to clarify a little bit, at the upper left, you see the Iowa Roadside Management Program logo. That refers to my office, which is within the Tallgrass Prairie Center at the University of Northern Iowa. So if you ever see an acronym IRM without the V, that means Iowa Roadside Management, basically my office. A few years ago, we came up, came up with this new logo and name for marketing purposes. We wanted a newer kind of attractive logo for my office. But the county programs themselves, you'll see a few examples below. Some of them have the long name that the Scott County Integrated Roadside Vegetation Management Program, IRVM. So that's the set of technical methods people use to manage roadsides. Some counties choose to shorten their name a little bit. So it's whatever each county decides to to use as their name might vary. I like to start out by showing a map of Iowa, showing how involved different counties are as far as their, their roadside programs. All the counties in green have a roadside vegetation manager. They have someone on staff whose job is to 
use those ecological kind of techniques, the reduced mowing, reduced herbicide use or targeted herbicide use, planting natives in the roadside. If they have a little plant symbol in the lower right of the county, that means they have an IRVM plan on file with the DOT. And the number means the number of years the county received seed from 1998 through 2021. So since 1998, my office has received a grant through the Federal Highway Administration where we can provide free prairie seed to counties that request it. That's really good seed. As some counties have requested it every year and very involved and other counties not so much. But most counties at least tried this prairie seed at some point. And at the, later on today, I will email everyone who's on this call or who registered for this call a packet of information that'll have the contact for each county. So the roadside manager's contact information or in counties out of roadside manager, the engineer. So just in case you wanna talk to one of your neighboring counties to get their perspective on how their program's going, what they're doing, you're always welcome to reach out to neighbors as well. But this just kind of shows roughly around half the Iowa counties have a roadside program or at least some aspect of roadside program. Maybe they have the plan, but they don't have a, a, full, a full time roadside manager yet. So, talk a little bit more about the seed. It's really good quality seed. Most of it originates from prairie plants that grow in unplowed prairie. We have a program for getting it from buying it from different seed vendors from around the state. It's worth usually around $220 to up to $350, $400 an acre. So that's a cost savings for the county right there. If you can get this free high quality seed to plant in your roadsides. So we offer two kinds of mixes. Each one has anywhere from 30 to 45, 50 species. And we give each county a seed ticket showing what species they have, that sort of thing. Some counties are really into this. They want to know what kind of native species they are getting each year. We try to include a variety. So in return, the county gets this high quality, expensive seed for free. They just have to keep track of where they're planting it. So they will turn in a seed planting report every six mm -hmm. months saying, this is what we planted. They have to include a map showing where they planted it. And you basically have about a year and a half to plant the seed. So the seed is one resource I can provide to counties. I also provide education and networking. We get grants from the Living Roadway Trust Fund to hold a couple of meetings a year. One is the Association for Integrated Roadside Management meeting. It's always right before the Weed Commissioner's Conference. A lot of the counties choose to make their roadside managers the weed commissioner, not all do, but since so many county roadside managers are also the weed commissioner, we try to have these back to back so they can just attend both at the roughly the same time. So it has been in Ames the, the first week in March. We're actually moving it to Prairie Meadows next spring, so that'll be something new. Maybe even a little bit more centralized and just a new location we wanted to try out. So again, Prairie Meadows and Des Moines will be the meeting there. And we always invite the, the roadside managers, the, the bulk of the audience, engineers, and county conservation board directors are always welcome to attend this. It's just a one day meeting from nine to two. We have various talks. Occasionally we might have equipment out in the parking lot, not every year. So that's why we have a picture of a equipment out in the parking lot if people want to take a look at it. But mostly it's indoors, you look at you network, you learn about various topics. Our biggest event we have every year is the annual roadside conference every September, again, funded with the help of the Living Roadway Trust Fund. This is larger, it's open to anyone. We usually have 80 to 110 people attend. We have an afternoon of field trips, talks, a banquet dinner on Thursday evening. So it usually goes Wednesday evening through Friday morning. And this one, we rotate around the state. The, the counties uh, like getting exposed to different programs. So each year, a different program helps host it. So you learn what they're doing in their county. Uh, this year, it's gonna be in Dickinson County at Okaboji. 
We're gonna have an afternoon of equipment demonstrations. That'll be one of the field trips where you can learn about all sorts of equipment related to roadside vegetation management. We'll have a boat, a steamboat tour of Okaboji will be another option. So we try to cater to different interests. And we're, yeah, we're really excited. I think it'll be a really neat area to have the conference and Dickinson County is doing a lot. They're trying to plant around 90 acres of roadsides a year. So they have a really active program. That'll be September 9th through 11th this year. And I can include that as well in the packet I'll be sending out if you want more information about attending that. Another nice perk we have about that, if your county doesn't have a roadside program, you're welcome to attend without a, you don't have to pay a registration free. So the registration fee, no charge if your county doesn't have a roadside manager on staff, if you wanna learn more about the programs. And that covers your meals, it doesn't cover lodging, but that covers your, basically your fee to attend and your meals. Another thing I do to help facilitate networking, I maintain a roadside management Google group. So anyone where they have a program or not, you're welcome to send an email to this list. There's over 150 people on it. Um, common questions might be, hey, I'm considering purchasing this piece of equipment. Do you have any experience with it? So you have this, all the, these great people have this expertise about using different kinds of equipment and you can get their practical knowledge of what it's like or a management te technique. Hey, do you have any advice for managing this particular species? Or can you share this job ad for some summer help or hiring for a roadside program? So that's really connects all the programs and helps them if they wanna ask questions of each other. I have a monthly e-newsletter that I send out to anyone who's interested that just kind of summarizes the news about roadside vegetation. So it's less interactive than the Google group. There might be news about research or new programs getting started or openings in the roadside world. Those are the kind of information I have in the Reuters Digest. Like Cody, I produce some outreach materials. It's kind of nice to have brochures on hand. Some people keep these at their county courthouse or in their vehicle. If members of the public have questions about, well, why are you spraying the roadsides or landowners often have questions. We have a brochure, especially for landowners. They have questions about the mowing law. Those are the types of resources we have for counties. And we produce handouts. Uh, we had some requests for a handout on brush cutting because some members of the public are concerned, why are you cutting down the brush? So we explain the safety benefits. We have a case study of Dickinson County, the host for this year's conference, the financial and environmental benefits of roadside prairies. Like why did they decide to really ramp up their program? And they kind of explain that. So that's just an overview of some of the resources I can provide in my office that kind of complements what the LRTF does. So seed, networking, education, brochures, handouts. Like I said, this is the first time we're trying this way of reaching a bunch of counties is having a virtual meeting. So that's something we're excited about, but we're also willing to visit your county. If your county is really interested in getting something going and you want us to talk to the County Board of Supervisors, we can do that. And this is just kind of a, a starting point just to provide you this information in this format. But you're always welcome to contact us if you have any questions or you'd like more assistance. Uh, that's what we're here for. Here's the website for the roadside information at the Tallgrass Prey Center, my contact information. We're on Facebook and Instagram. And I should also note we have a YouTube channel. So if you just search YouTube for Iowa Roadside Management, we have two videos in particular you might be interested in. They're around three to three and a half minutes. And they, there's an interview with an engineer from Jones County and the roadside manager from Jones County. And you might find those helpful. There's some other videos as well. But again, YouTube is another resource for my program. And with that, I am open to any questions. Christine, I get those, uh, I get the rotor digest, but how do I post to that group if I have questions? 
oh, the Google groups, if you have questions, you just send an email to roadside-management at UNI, and I'll put it in the chat. So if you email that, it'll go to around 150 people. A lot of the times people will just respond to you privately, but you, they might respond all to the entire group as well. And just depends on what your question is. Sweet, thank you. And that again is open to anyone. You don't have to have a program. You're just like, hey, I have a question about this piece of equipment. It's not working well, or can you recommend a better brand? That sort of question or, or common. Okay. There's no other questions. Let's see, Damien. Where Damien is, I'll have to make sure you're unmuted. I think I muted a lot of people. So you should be able to unmute and share. But just, yeah, just tell, let us know how long you've been with Montgomery County as their roadside manager, how it's going, or what, why your county decided to get involved, or yeah, I guess basically how you run your program, why your county okay. has a program. Okay. Yeah, again, my name's Damian Bond. I'm the roadside manager and the week commissioner for Montgomery County. Can you hear me okay, Christine? Yes, you're a little light. If you can speak a little louder, that might help. <clears throat> okay. My name is Damian Bond, roadside manager and weed commissioner for Montgomery County. I've been down here with the department 28 years. We have two full-time employees, and our department does operate from our own budget, and we have our own expenditures. Uh, the first IRVM program was established October of 1990, and it looks like the main benefits at that time were to redu reduce herbicide usage by eliminating the blanket spraying. Uh, prior to 1990, the last contracted spraying was, was roughly $28,000, and if you look at the records that we have that go back to the late 60s, early 70s, those contracts we're increasing roughly $1,800 a year. Fast forward here to 2022, you know, we would have been praying you know, roughly 88,000 uh, alone for right away spraying. And at that time they were just uh, spraying half the county. And in those times they did keep pretty good records. And each year of those contracted spraying years, they were having several off target injuries uh, to trees, gardens, and so on. Uh, so I think public perception back then was not so good. Compared to what we do now, we just spot spray with two applicators uh, using UTVs and probably cover two thirds of the county, uh, obviously for a lot less money and for a lot less gallons being sprayed as well. Um, another benefit I would think would be our county's need was to combine the week commissioner with the roadside manager. And it looked like early on, <clears throat> that's how they initially funded the roadside program was through the week commissioner funds and also the funds they were using to contract the spraying. And then I think they found that having someone on hand to manage the existing uh, roadside remnants that we had and to Established new warm season plantings. You know, over the 28 years, uh, experience has shown me that these plants and plantings in the right setting do help control your base of uh, broadleaf and woody species. And those plantings, the larger plantings, we do try to uh, burn every three to five years, and that, that does help control the woody species as well. Uh, the, uh, probably the main bullet point on my contract would be the tree and brush control. Uh, for the past 30 years, we've been utilizing a boom mower during the winter months. This has been a great tool to help push back the brush along with select herbicide treatments after the mowing. We try to go back and retreat any re-sprouts 
that have developed after mowing a large section of, of roads. Uh, that, that does seem to help quite a bit. But along with the boom mower and herbicide spraying, we do uh, run a large chipper and we try to just concentrate on hazards, uh, stuff that could be affecting the traveling public. We do not have a clear cut policy um, saying we don't, we don't cut every tree from the edge of the road to the fence line. We just concentrate on trees that are affecting the traveling public. Um, another benefit to having the <clears throat> roadside manager would be having someone on hand to help control some of these roadside disturbances after a, a ditch clean or a cross pipe relay or a road upgrade. It's nice to have someone here to maybe decide what species to put at that location depending on what the existing vegetation is around the project or where the project lies geography. Now, we do use a lot of erosion control mat and uh, hydro seed. That, the hydro seeding does help control the erosion quite a bit. And we do run a lot of cool seasons through the hydro seeder, probably more so than warm season, just depending on uh, what projects uh, we're doing at that time. Um, those are some of the bigger points I would think or benefits having the IRVM program. Uh, some tips I would say to new managers or people looking at getting the program would be to maybe set up a fair booth. I've found that's been pretty beneficial at our local county fair. We try to do that every couple of years. At first, you will maybe get some questions regarding, you know, when they're going to fix such and such bridge or, you know, why don't they rock my road more often? But I think as your program sticks around, they see the benefits that you're doing and then the, those questions tend to favor your, your program. Uh, another would be a tip would be don't overextend the natives. I think one of the biggest mistakes we probably made initially was feed natives all the time everywhere. And it, that just wasn't working in some of the locations, some of these ditch cleans that were down in the valleys and prone to a lot of disturbance, they just didn't survive and were overcome by cool seasons anyways. And another tip I would say was to use the LRTF. That has been a great benefit to our program, aided in the purchase of our two UTVs and our spray units, help fund our chipper, at the bottom chainsaws um, it's, and it's done attachments for our compact tractor and, and the list goes on and on over the years on seed and, and various other equipment. It's been great. And then another would be, you know, using UNI <clears throat> and Christine has been good to get us uh, educational materials and handouts for our fair booth and organizing the annual roadside meeting. I would encourage any new manager to go to those meetings. It's, there are some really smart people there and they're just great to listen to. And if you got a question specifically, there someone's always there to answer it or give give their, their point of view. All I have to give right now, I guess, is there any questions? Howdy neighbor, Damien. Um, Hello. I've heard so, but I've I've been told that since taking this position down here that I should I should contact you and talk to you because you're just you know right down the road. Uh, I've not taken advantage of that yet, but uh, I probably will at some point in time. You'll get a phone call from me. But I I just want yeah, to ask. Be great. So, I look forward to it. Yeah. Um, the for your brush mowing, so you you just cut everything with a brush hog or pecan or whatever you got, and then you follow up um, with herbicide treatment. Do you, like, how much, how much of those stems do you actually have to retreat? And uh, what, what product do you personally use? Because it sounds like the situation is very similar. Uh, our, our regime here coming into the county in Mills is that they, they mow the brush sides, that's their, or the road sides, they mow all the brush, that's their, the road crew's busy work in the wintertime, uh, but there, there is not herbicide follow-up 
And so it's a lot of really dense kind of dog hair stands of, of brush along mm -hmm. the roadsides that kind of need to be addressed. So I just kind of, yep. what your experience is. Yeah, the, the products have changed over years, but uh, <clears throat> you're right, the, the brush mowing, it, it will become hairy oh, right after the mowing the following year. Um, in the years past, we had one more operator, and that was his main job was to mow grass, mow brush, and, and we still do that. And if we found that over the years, if, if that same mile kept getting mowed and mowed and mowed, the, the brush would creep back down the floor slope to the dish bottom. But we found it's a lot quicker process if we mow it and then maybe come July, late June, go back and maybe re and spray some of those re sprout, spray the foliage. You know, they, they might be two, three feet top, tall, but it's, it's a quicker process to get that brush pushed back. Um, the products, we, I use the same for my broadleaves as I do the brush. We use a, a Duracore and an Escort, and that, it seems to work really well. But we, had a, we had a large infestation of mulberries along the four slope and ditch bottom, you know, back in the early 90s. And having this boom mower out there, and it's, it's a process. You have to have it out there every year, and you will see some benefits. It just takes a few years to get to that point. To get to those points, we did, you know, the first three or five years, we went through our first boom mower fairly quickly. The, we ruined the deck, and then, then the new one, that one lasted 10 years, and then now we're, we're on our third one now, and it's it's still holding up pretty well. But you'll see the oh size of brush gets smaller and smaller, and the mower lasts longer and longer. But. Are there any other yeah, questions? I'd love to meet it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Damien. Yeah, I I don't have any questions. I was just going to say I'd love to meet up with uh, the, the new manager and uh, we could go over some things. It'd be, it'd be good. Yeah, that'd be good. I'll I'll find your phone number and give you a call. Yeah, look forward to it. Yeah, you just demonstrated what we try to encourage to people in neighboring counties for those new road safety managers often reach out to each other and visit each other's shops. It's another way to learn more as people get oriented to their job. We also have an orientation manual we created in the last year or so, similar to how the other county offices like the engineer, county conservation board director, I believe they have orientation manuals. That's another thing we can provide. What kind of, what are your worst noxious weed problems that you've been dealing with lately, Damien? Oh, I'd say poison hemlock is probably the biggest evasive that's I see reoccurring more and more often. Um, it's, it's easily treatable once found early because it greens up early right after snow and it's, it's easy to treat, but it seems to be spreading to disturbed areas a lot more than, than other. And Canadian thistle is always a big one, but it doesn't seem to be overly evasive. It, once it's in a spot, it seems to stay there. Okay. Could you repeat what chemicals you were using on cut respout trees? We had someone in the chat ask that. Yeah, <clears throat> we're using, it's called DuraCore, along with Escort. And then we use an MSO, methylated seed oil, as the as factant. And so you use DuraCore and Escort. And what was the last one? It's uh, we'll called a Loctite. It's an MSO, methylated seed oil. It's a surfactant. MSO, methylated seed oil, a surfactant? Yes. Okay. Yep. This seems to work really well on, uh, you had to foliar apply it. Works good on the reef sprouts and it. It does a pretty good job on all woody, uh, woody species, except for ash and cedar. Still, we have a tough time killing that, mainly cedars. It might take two years of treatments to kill a cedar tree. But we try to treat trees that are you know, five, six foot smaller. I don't try to treat anything larger. We'll just hand cut those. Okay. 
it's another benefit of having these two annual meetings because certain parts of the state are dealing with problems that other counties aren't. And so there might be counties near you who are dealing with the same thing. Absolutely. Any other questions? There's no other questions. Like I said, I'll be sending out more information later. You're welcome to provide feedback since this is the first time we've tried this. So we can incorporate that into the next time. We'll probably try having these at least a couple times a year if there's enough interest in counties learning more about roadside programs in this manner. And do you have any final remarks, Cody, or anything you want to share? So if you're on mute, Cody. Yeah, I was just saying this was a real good turnout. So thanks for everybody for being on. And you can go to the LRTF website, iowalivingroadway.com, or send an email to Tara. Um, you can find the email on the website if you have any more questions that come up or questions about the grant process. Okay. Well, thank you, Cody, for your time this morning explaining what you do. And also, Damien, really appreciate it. And also, thank you, everyone, for attending. Just reach out if you have any questions or use these other resources we mentioned if you want to reach out to other counties. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy yeah. the rest of your day thank and you. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, the rest you. of your week. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is good. Have a good day. You too. You too.